everything can be covered, but clothing, are there any tailors in Lafayette? Probably not, because we kill that skill, right? And, or we have to go. Um, I wanted to ask a question about consumer expectations. Um, you know, anyone I think under probably, you know, 70, you know, has grown up in a fairly globalized trade environment. Um, you know, we expect to walk into grocery stores in January and find strawberries. You know, we expect, you know, two day delivery on Amazon Prime. You know, we, that's become part of culture. Um, and I'm not sure how you put the genie back in the bottle on the consumer expectation for globalized trade, uh, instant products, um, long range, like supply chains, far reaching, Complex, uh, you, know, uh, you know, French truffles on a Tuesday. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how you change that um, because it is very much become embedded in how we live. Um, and I don't think, you know, I only know a handful of people who I can say are probably not guilty of the, like the wanting things that are not mobile uh, on a regular basis or are not made in the way that they, you know, hope things are made. And so um, we can try to create local solutions for those desires, definitely, you know, greenhouses and what have you, but it's not going to be at the same level that we're used to. And so changing that, that is a, that's a culture change. And especially when it comes to food, um, you know, I've, I've watched remarkable things happen in local communities with uh, other kinds of products, but with food, it is so embedded in how people live and how they think, and I'm not sure <coughs> it's easier to change your joke in the car about uh, easier to change how people think than how, how they eat. Um, so that, 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 that's something that concerns me, one of the many things that concerns me. So I'm not sure what we do on that locally. Make it six. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, there's been a, a real change, a real change in those local farmers markets. You know, just in the last 20 years, the growth of farmers markets has been phenomenal. Because people say, I really like it fresh. I really care that social component. I go to the farmer's market. I have relationships. You know, I start these conversations with my growers. They know me now. They don't know me by name, but I'm the one who wants the blah, blah. You know, and so it takes, but I, I'm amazed at the change. The, there's a lot of local food things, you know, craft beers. I mean, you think about the beer companies around the world, there's one or two or three of them. And now there are a lot of these small crap, and the, the cost, the real cost of food at Walmart doesn't include the real cost of food. You know, it's it's a it's a poorly priced, uh, um, incorrectly priced. That cheap food comes at a cost that we're not paying for. So you're right. Ch I, I don't have an answer to you to change, but things have to change. You know, so I am hopeful that that this kind of takes. It's not going to be overnight but it gets people thinking here. You know, what are ways we individually can start businesses or, or start talking to each other as social, economic entities that start to create more? Because who was the first farmer's market? I mean, who said, let's go Saturday morning at 6 in the morning and show up with our tomatoes? And, and, and in Bloomington, we have a winter's market that goes 11 months out of the year, and they're still packed. So you're right, it's not everybody's there, but there's a trend, and we are not. It, we're way, it is a subtle way that we did it. We, we didn't serve anything, and we don't do that at, at any event. And we don't give away any trinkets to remember us <laughs> and all of them. What we ask you is to buy the good food from city. Uh, so we try to do it by example, you know, subtle or less, uh, less uh, subtle. If you think about every conference that you go to, there is the same junk and a ton of it is being thrown away, even if it's composted, it's still a waste. And, uh, and it's all junk, right? Or you know, the free breakfast. I don't want the free breakfast because it's catastrophic. I don't eat it. I, run, I have my own breakfast with me when I travel. Um, so it is a lot of effort, and we all agree, but it's possible.
possible. And you do it through these small steps. Uh, again, I do it personally, so when they ask me, did you find everything all right at the cashier? Yeah. No, you had to not stop made in China. I, it's not, it, it's free for me to give them this feedback. Well, one will listen, the second one will listen, the store manager will get the idea, and then they will say, oh, there is this crazy woman who always asks about where things are made. Uh, right and and or uh, I go and struggle with uh, with the association that says uh, buy local. So I go in the boutique. Everything is made in China, but it is not buy locally. Fundamentally, it has to be made locally. Otherwise, I'm not being trust. Uh, we can go once together with me. Yeah, no, and, and I, I think that like there's some really compelling stuff with like local garments, you know, things. I used to live in New York, and you know, I love fashion. And there's only two, two designers who still piece the pattern in New York City because they sold out the garment district to developers. Yeah, the the yeah, so there's very few who still piece the pattern in New York City. So that makes like a, a compelling question of why does New York even host Fashion Week anymore? There's no more fashion left made in New York. And that's like the dirty secret of Fashion Week is that there's very few designers left. And so it's, I love supporting local artists, but for example, in Indiana, there are very few textile mills. The textiles all come from overseas. It's very hard to buy domestically made cotton or linen or even silk or anything. So, um, so yeah, like it creates a gap in what I think we can reasonably expect, especially what we become customers to do in order to pressure this to be more than just a niche market. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I um, I started to develop a problem with othering the problems. Like there's so, like someone else is creating the problems, but every single participant in society is creating the problems. Everyone who has an independent retirement account is Wall Street, and they expect it to grow. And they, if, if it doesn't, they get hacked off, and they demand that Wall Street recover. Um, and so. It's it is, but it's how do we how do we change our own purchasing behaviors, and how do we not just do it in our lives? How do we how do we help other people see the value in that, and also how do we make it affordable to the people who have been traditionally excluded? Because right now, like poor people don't shop at City Foods; it's too expensive. It's a it's a luxury. It's a pri it's a privilege to shop here. And so, how do we how do we create it? How do we compete? Because if it's not economically sustainable or viable, it's not going it's not going to happen. Um, and so how do we compete with the expectations, with the efficiencies that have been produced? And I think the efficiencies of the global economy will, will reduce when transportation costs go up, unless we can come up with really interesting sustainable ones. But, I mean, we've been living in a global economy for hundreds of years. You know, it was coffee, tea, spices, you know, and it's just gotten a lot faster and a lot more, more robust. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and maybe we can live without you. You said that, oh, if I don't I have grapes, those are not grapes. <laughs> That's why everything. Uh, but if we go back to farmer's market, then we get back into, back into seasonality. If we have urban gardens, and the work that, that you do, uh, uh, you, know, that, that, uh, uh, you grow your own food. And then all of a sudden, so let's say even if you don't make money, you have saved a lot of money that you've been giving away to some big bottles or so that bring you from Australia. Where are they bring a kiwi from Australia? I'd rather live without kiwi. Um, but, uh, so they have to buy for that food. Or you said, oh, who is going to buy for that But if we get people to make more, right? If we get back the table, if we patronize everybody to be fair, if we ask the people at Matchbox to do some of our stuff instead of go and buy it from hardware store or whatever, uh, then then value will be created in the community. But these are really the so-called wicked problems. They're not easy to solve. But our determination is to do everything possible to contribute to solving them. And I think by having these tools and bouncing back uh, uh, on each other ideas, and especially success stories. So not everything is, look, you're doing it, right? This place exists, and I hope it will it will continue to, to grow. Uh, you have Austin who does, uh, who provides you with a lot of uh, food, uh, and a lot of all the restaurants. So things are picking up. Are we very small? Yes. 
but uh, definitely, definitely things are changing. I mean, there, there were no farmers working in Indiana when we first came in the <coughs> 90s. Now are how many? And they're full. So you can see, you can see the trend. That, like you said, people are preoccupied by health, because they are preoccupied, but, but we don't have enough income. Nobody has enough income because everybody sees that, except very few. Um, that our health is poor, we are unhappy, so clearly we need to do something. Fortunately, a lot of people are doing something. And uh, uh, we're not talking today a lot about manufacturing because we don't really want to start with the most boring stuff. I like it, but not everybody does. Um, but we, we, we are going to talk about manufacturing also. And uh, we'll do that hopefully in Gary, Indiana, which was all bound by the destruction of the of manufacturing. Uh, and we 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 still have time to show you a lot of excellent examples. There are now companies that will make cars loads. So you don't need a big manufacturing. I don't want to offend sewer in, in the area they are okay. <laughs> uh, especially if they start making tram cars and trains a lot um, you can make your own you can make a lot of your own things, but it's all, it also depends on us how we value this. Again, if we go at, at a consignment store and expect the dress to be five dollars, then we're not going to make this work, right? Uh, so, okay, I don't have twenty dollars, so let me not buy anything and save for two months or four months and get to the twenty dollars because I really want to get that used dress instead of a new one uh, that is made uh, who knows uh, where in a chicken. It takes a lot of effort, uh, but it's not impossible. And the good news is that there are a lot of people doing it, and you include it. And we just have to uh, get more and more people to, to change their to change their habits. Uh, Again, the food, uh, uh, whenever somebody says that, well, through the Green Revolution, we saved, uh, we solved the food problem, and now we can feed 9 million people. Yes, but that's not food. 90% of it is not food. So it depends how we talk, how, how we, how we uh, defend our values, uh, and in the end, what we do. So do I go and buy from the, the big store? No. Um, my actual piece is in agriculture, um, and I think we need to be really careful about the way that we view the industrial food system, because I personally think it's a modern wonder. I, I mean, our great-grandparents, if you told them that you can go and get safe, stable, cheap food, they would have been like, oh my god, it's the most amazing thing ever. And so it's not always the healthiest, I agree with that, but I think that I'm very good friends with the head of food science, and he really gets tired of people acting like he's like... Like, food scientists are like, you know, these, these horrible people who want to, like, poison you. Like, no, they're trying to meet your demands as a consumer. And so I think that shifting attitudes are changing the way that food is produced. I mean, major companies are starting to take artificial colorings out. And they're starting to, you know, change the ingredients and reduce high fructose corn syrup and all these different things. Um, but I don't, I don't want the industrial food system to go away. Go away. Like, I, I want canned goods. Um, I don't. I I want canned goods. I want them coming from a factory because you know, like I've canned stuff before, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time. And if we, if we all have to, I mean, to me, like I, I think specialization is important because if if we do, I can't spend all my time meeting my needs, my my survival needs. And so, how do we create? How do we create a balance between? I contribute something to society, which gives me the the means to acquire the things that other people produce, and you know. But, yeah. Absolutely, the idea, the, what is bad about uh, about industrialized uh, agriculture is how much damage it does. Mm -hmm. Not the good part. And absolutely, we need the science, uh, but we don't need that, that volume, and we don't need the obsession with cheapness, right? Because that's why you eliminated quality. Mm -hmm. At that price, that is not quality. It is something are not even food. I mentioned that bread is, uh, is my favorite food. If you see 10 components on the label of a bread, that cannot be bread. Right now, how many components does a bread need? Three, four, so industrial bread should not exist. And, and just to interject that 40% of our food ends up as waste anyways. Yeah. 
but you're right. We need a balance of it again. It's not going back and we're going all the way. And, and I don't think it, it's about specialization so much as an uh, economic model driven through one thing and one thing only. Profit. Profit all top. So the food can be unhealthy if it provides more profit. Even the corporate model of shareholders, you know, shareholders have a responsibility to the corporate model for profitability. Mm -hmm. uh, that model drives a certain kind of specialization in production that's not the only for any of us. You take Exxon, hell, Exxon knew about climate change when. The scientists who were involved, they knew too. So all that's driven around how do we get the maximum amount of a particular kind of profit, uh, uh, economic profit. Mm -hmm at the expense of other kinds of capital. I would say social and cultural capital. So, yeah, I do think specialization can work and is effective. I, too, don't want to go and do what somebody else can do better than me. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have to look at how do we change that model so that it's inclusive of other aspects of capital, social, cultural, and even symbolic, that allows us to say, oh, well, the profit and loss statement includes these other things because what is wealth at the end of the day? It's really how you measure it. It's a social construct. You know, we decide what, what has value, what, what wealth is. You know, it's, 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 it's imaginary for the most part, other than what we decide it is. So that's the piece that we have to have to change. I think we change that, then healthy food can be created in a way that says, oh well this 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 has more value than unhealthy food. Just, I've been blessed by this conversation. It seems to me like we have a pretty good handle on the problem. Can we move on to some solutions now? Thank you, John. Uh, so uh, we are obviously behind on time, so maybe we'll, we'll go through this very quickly and then take a break. And, yeah. Uh, repair. Uh, I fix it. It's a community of young people in, in California who developed a business that uh, learn, uh, teach themselves how to repair everything. And they started with the non repairable stuff the iPad, the iPhone that Apple never wanted us to be able to repair. These, uh, these youngsters figured it out. And how, you know, what's their contribution? They don't do repair for us. Uh, but they sell repair kits because they need to develop special kits in order to repair these uh, locked uh, systems. And they share repair manuals. So if you are somewhere in, uh, in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, you can read, because somebody will translate it in, in the local language, uh, you can read how to repair. And it's not only our phones. Now they're working on tractors, whatever people think of, of, of repairing. And this is an example of, uh, of a business that can succeed. So you know, they've been in business for I don't know how many years, and they are expanding. And it's a, it's a global community, so it's a combination of a voluntary work, because people translate the manuals or post the manuals uh, for free, and selling some products, which is the repair uh, kit that uh, they make. Um, I wanted to show you a very out there example for reuse. This is a rocket made by SpaceX, and this is their successful return of a rocket uh, on Earth. Their plan is to reuse rockets, right? Instead of uh, blowing them up over the ocean. And if we can reuse such an object, which is probably the most complicated one we make, then we can figure out how to reuse uh, everything. Uh, so I'll skip uh, the, the video we like to. Uh, give you this excellent example of uh, uh, reusing a building, an abandoned <coughs> building, and an abandoned, abandoned lot. Uh, what for? For urban farming. So there are examples that we can uh, we can learn from. So what does that mean? These people are very eager to share with all of us how they made it. Uh, so we don't waste time and money on our own and go through the unnecessary uh, failures. Remanufacturing, uh, uh, again, it's quite a big business uh, in the United uh, States. Uh, I, I won't uh, stay on the numbers, but it can be better. So I think we could leave for 10 years or more with everything we already have just by repairing it, reusing it, remanufacturing. We don't need anything new. Uh, but these are all examples that should encourage all of us that this is possible. 
uh, if we all uh, uh, try uh, very well. Uh, I won't show you that this is recycling, but I want to show you the paradox of recycling. These are all new electronics. They have never been taken out of the box. They were not selling, so they went straight to recycling. That is for me catastrophic. So on the one hand, yes, excellent, we can recycle e-waste and it's excellent business. But why did we why did we make those new uh, those things in the first place? So uh, that's why you know, we have to be very uh, skeptical about recycling, and it should be the, the last resort. Um, we won't have time to, to run this, but this is an, an excellent, uh, you, you want to go Just on. briefly, how many of you are familiar with Interface Carpet? Okay. Awesome. Yes, it's a wonderful company. Um, carpet used to be made of mostly petrochemical, really toxic production. Um, Ray Anderson had a carpet, traditional carpet company. He realized how he was ruining the earth with what he was doing, changed the company totally around. Some of the carpet is compostable. They, they have carpet tiles, they retake them, they reuse what they take back, and if you have a chance, on your own time, Google Interface Carpet, and this is uh, the fishing nets recovery, where they're, in, in the Philippines, they're having local fishermen actually collect all the, the nets that are discarded, winding these nets, the fiber, and selling them to Interface to use as raw material for their carpet. And it's socially, it's been wonderful for the villagers. They have, they have ideas of going for education, etc. But it's a beautifully done video, so I strongly urge you to, to look this up later. We want to get through and, and get to... Yeah, I, I uh, to do this, but I got to Okay. You okay. said you had some comments. We'll send you these we'll slides. Send you, we'll send you the presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then you can see the videos. You have a lot of practices. And continue to... I did not. <coughs> but we'll get... Leave your email with us and we'll get it to you. Okay. Uh, so right. somebody, yeah, leave, please leave your email. But we want to take, probably it's a good time to take a break. Um, five, ten minutes. Well, I have a question just before the break. Does anybody know if you could buy interface carpets in, in Indiana? Indiana? Yes, you can. You can. You'll tell me where? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, in Europe they have started using hemp and other biomass materials. So, Let's go 10 minutes, come back, and um, we'll start with the next. Yeah, we'll, we'll move into the line.